Hi, and welcome to Socratic Studios. On this podcast, you can enjoy deep discussions and interviews about everything science-related with the best minds in the field. My name is Vishnu, and this episode will be about a curious new enzyme produced by a species of methane-eating bacteria that can turn greenhouse gases into fuel. With me today, I have Dr. Jan Kern from Berkeley Lab. Welcome, Dr. Kern. It's an honor to have you on the podcast. So before we dive into the specifics of your research, could you, could you give us a brief overview of your research, please? Yeah, so I'm a structural biology um, person, so I studied chemistry and focused on physical chemistry and then went to structural biology and biophysics. So I'm really interested in metalloenzymes and their structure and how the structure of these these molecular machines um, allows them to do really complicated um, reactions with very high efficiency. And so um, we focused on a number of different metalloenzymes. So metalloenzymes are enzymes that have a metal ion, most times a transition metal ion in these cases, um, in their active site. So this metal ion is essential for the activity of these um, machines basically. And so we focus on several different of these enzymes. And one of these is the methane monooxygenase, the soluble methane monooxygenase that we discussed in this recent publication. And so we use a new method to study these, this enzyme. And this new method is using very short X-ray pulses, which are on the order of um, femtoseconds, so several tens of femtosecond long. So femtosecond is um, 10 to the minus 15 seconds long. So it's a really, really short X-ray pulse. And we use these very short pulses to, to get a picture of the enzyme. And the advantage of this very short pulse is that we can probe the enzyme um, so fast that the atoms in the enzyme do not really move. And um, do not get affected by the X-ray um, um, radiation that we put on them to measure it. So that way we can um, measure things um, without damaging them, because the damage that happens to these um, to the atoms basically by the high X-ray intensity is slower than the measurement time we use, and this allows us to measure these things at room temperature. And so we were able to look at the structure of this enzyme soluble methane monooxygenase at room temperature, which is different from um, all the studies done before, where people usually freeze the samples and keep them at very low temperature to avoid damaging them while they are measured. And this gave us now an idea how the enzyme actually looks like when it works. So we can get the structural picture in the same state um, that it is in when it does its actual work in the bacteria. And so we found a few nice, um, interesting things which are different from previous um, studies. And so we, we saw that actually next to the metal center in this enzyme, there's a um, like a cavity where the methane um, can bind. And this cavity changes its shape and under different conditions. And so we get some idea how actually by changing the shape of this cavity, the enzyme can um, select um, methane. So it can make sure that only the substrate it wants to oxidize gets put in there in this active site. Um, yeah. So, and the nice thing is we could measure the enzyme in two different conditions. So um, the metal center, so the metal ions in the center of this enzyme can be in different oxidation states. So they can be either reduced or oxidized um, or in some intermediate states during the reaction. And we measured it in two different states in the fully reduced state, which is the state before the oxidation takes place, before the reaction takes place, and in the oxidized state, which is at the end of the reaction. And this shows us that we can now um, use the same setup in future measurements to look at different states in between. So we um, established um, a way to look at this enzyme 
in functional conditions and we want to push this in the future to measure at different um, time points in this reaction. And I think that's a rough summary of <laughs> what we did. Yeah, that, that was a really good overview. Um, I, I think now it'll be easier for the audience to understand your answers to some of the more specific questions I have now. Um, so uh, can you tell us a bit about the bacteria that produces the SMMO enzyme? Yeah, so these are metanotrophic bacteria. So these are bacteria that are found in um, special environments where there is methane available. Um, so these bacteria, um, they live on methane. So they use methane as their energy source and oxidize it um, to methanol and then use the methanol in later steps in their metabolism. Um, so they are found in many different environments, for example, in um, rice paddies, so where um, you have um, very low oxygen level in the in the water, in the soil underneath the water. Um, and in these regions, often you have bacteria that produce methane. And then next to these methane producing bacteria, you find other bacteria that actually use the methane and oxidize it to methanol um, and gain their energy from that reaction. Um, and so there's, they also are found in some hot springs where there's um, very low oxygen levels and um, also in different um, marine environments, so in the sea under different conditions. So they are quite widespread in these special habitats and they don't rely on um, oxygenic metabolism um, like many other bacteria you usually know um, rely on, but they can really use methane um, under these very low oxygen conditions and partially oxidize it to methanol and then use that as their energy source. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's a lot of interest in these bacteria. Also, you, you often fin find them, for example, in landfills, um, so where you have um, a lot of... Um, methane production due to the decomposition of the um, organic material in the landfill. Um, and so there's quite some interest in how one could use these kinds of bacteria to selectively oxidize methane to methanol and um, to reduce the methane production from these sites. So one can think about using such bacteria to um, then capture basically the methane and produce methanol out of it and then extract the methanol and use that, for example, as a fuel or in other later industrial processes. All right. Um, so what exactly is the role of these bacteria in their environments? Um, so they basically use that niche. <laughs> um, so um, as there are many bacteria that can decompose organic material and produce methane out of the um, organic material, um, then there's a abundant source, basically, um, of energy that these bacteria can use. So they um, can use the methane and um, partially oxidize it to methanol and thrive on that, in that niche, basically use the byproduct of another species um, as their... Um, their input. So um, I think they are important in, in keeping the carbon cycle there. So to, to basically recycle some of the methane that would be released into the environment and keep it from escaping from the carbon cycle in that ecological um, niche or in that um, ecosystem. So they are essential to, to cycle around the, the carbon in these regions and I think they have a important impact also on the total methane uh, budget in the atmosphere so if you would not have these um, methane eating <laughs> bacteria then the release of methane into the atmosphere would be way higher than what we currently have and as methane is a very potent um, greenhouse gas so um, its effect on warming is way higher than um, from carbon dioxide, for example, 
um, this is a very important global role as well to keep the methane levels that are released from um, biological activity um, in the earth, uh, in the soil, for example, um, to keep that release low enough um, to keep the overall temperature stable, basically, in the atmosphere. Yeah. So what's the process by which uh, these bacteria are able to create the enzyme? So they they have the gene um, the genes for this enzyme, um, and they then, depending on the environmental condition, they regulate the expression of of these genes. Um, I'm not that familiar with the details of the assembly of the um, complete enzyme because it consists of. Um, three subunits in total and this metal center and the active side. Um, so I'm not aware of detailed studies about the assembly of it, but I think it's relatively straightforward upregulation of the genes depending on the methane content in the environment. And then they express these and um, build up the enzyme from the three subunits. And as far as I know, the metal side can basically spontaneously assemble once the enzyme is um, expressed, so got it, got it. Um, so now, um, I, I have a question for our more uh, layperson audience. Mm -hmm. uh, could you tell us exactly what an enzyme is? Yes. <laughs> so an enzyme is um, very simple. In simple terms, it's a machine, um, a biological machine. Um, on a very small scale that can do very complicated processes in an efficient way. So all chemical or most chemical um, transformations that happen in an organism are catalyzed or are driven by enzymes because many chemical transformations would happen very slowly if they are not um, driven by a specific machine. And so enzymes... Um, work like a catalyst, if someone is aware of this um, <laughs> term. So they um, can speed up a reaction um, very, with, to a very high level um, by reducing the energy that is required um, on the path of the reaction. And so enzymes are essential in all um, processes where um, chemical reactions take place in an organism. And they are built up like a protein, so they are proteins, so they're built up from amino acids, and um, but in they are different, or they are a subgroup of proteins as they catalyze a reaction, whereas proteins could also be just stabilizing structures or things like that. So there are many different classes of proteins, and enzymes are an important group of proteins all right um so could you then uh tell us a bit more about the structure of the protein that you discovered yeah so we didn't discover the protein itself. Oh, not, not it was... discovered that you studied yeah. sorry yeah. yeah yeah so this was already studied for a long time um but we um solved the structure of this protein at room temperature which is different from previous studies um so it's a large protein it's basically um it's forming it's it has two copies which um hold together <laughs> um so they form a dimeric structure and um in addition to the big part of that um, protein so the main subunit there's a smaller so-called regulatory subunit which um binds to it so it's a total of four um, protein chains so um two big and two small ones in this dimer and in each of these um, big chains, there is um, a small pocket, like a, um, yeah, you can say a pocket or cavity, um, where two iron atoms are bound. And these two iron atoms are arranged in a very specific way um, so that um, they are in a precise distance that allows them to um, bridge, to be bridged by two oxygen atoms or water. For example, and these two iron atoms are 
in the um, arrange there um, to to allow the reaction to proceed. Um, so we have this um, this pocket where the two iron atoms are located, and next to these two iron atoms, there's like um, a certain size empty space, which just has the right size that methanol can um, be trapped in this empty space, and then um, get very close to these two iron atoms, and then that's the the place where the reaction takes place, so that methanol um, can then be oxidized from the ions. In addition, this very this second part of the protein, the smaller subunit, um, seems to be very important for um, changing the activity of the enzyme. So if you don't have it present, the enzyme is not very active. But if you have this additional subunit present, it changes the structure of the entire um, machine. Basically, it's kind of a switch. So if you have this present, then the machine becomes way more active. And so the idea is that um, the organism can um, change the amount of the small subunit very quick by just synthesizing more of it. Um, and that way it can regulate, so it can um, push um, this machine to be more active or less active. And we saw that this structural change due to the binding of the small protein to the bigger one um, changes the um, the size of the um, the cavity where the um, methane, methane can bind. So we get we got some idea how this um, switch basically works for the enzyme. All right. Um, so how is this enzyme able to turn methane into methanol? Yeah, this is a big question, <laughs> which we want to solve. And um, so the idea is that it um, it first oxidizes the iron um, atoms. So iron um, can change its oxidation state. And most times in natural environments, iron is either in iron 3 or in iron 2 oxidation state. And so this enzyme can actually... Um, change the oxidation state of the iron atoms inside. And so if you um, have this iron uh, normally in a low oxidation state, so in iron um, oxidation state 2, but then it can be oxidized to oxidation state 3. And then it, the idea is it could even get oxidized higher to oxidation state 4. And this iron, which is more oxidized, is very reactive, so it wants to react with other species around. Um, but um, as the enzyme has this specific cavity where the iron is bound, um, it limits what other molecules are next to this oxidized iron. And so the idea is that by holding the methane, which can enter in this cavity, in the right place and in a very specific orientation next to this oxidized iron, it allows the um, iron side to oxidize only this methane. And so it can really then insert an oxygen in this um, methane, so in the carbon-hydrogen bond in methane to create a carbon-oxygen bond there. Um, but the exact detail how it can do it is still not clear. And that's why we were really interested in studying this. We hope to, to do measurements in the next um, few months where we can actually look at different steps in this binding of methane to the iron and to see how the iron um, changes its oxidation state and then changes the methane to methanol. Yeah, when 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 I first uh, looked at the at the um, compounds uh, methane and methanol, I I used my basic chemistry to draw like the Lewis dot structures, all of that kind of stuff, and then I realized that methanol had an oxygen in it, and I was like, and 
in it, like basically initially I thought it was just changing changing the bonds in in some sort of a different way, but then I realized it was just adding a whole oxygen in there, and that was really interesting to me how I was able to do that. Yeah, so it takes molecular oxygen. So oxygen comes from O2. Um, and then this molecular oxygen is split into um, two oxygens. So OH and OH, basically. And then one of them is inserted into the um, um, carbon-hydrogen bond. So it's really a... Um, not just a rearrangement, but it's forming a new bond with this oxygen. And this is very challenging to do um, in a synthetic way. So if you want to do that um, in an industrial way, you usually use very um, energy-intensive processes. So this is the Fischer-Tropsch process, where you use high temperatures to selectively generate methanol from methane because um, this this bond between carbon and hydrogen is very stable and so you need to um, put a lot of effort energy into breaking this bond but then you need to do it very carefully that you don't completely oxidize it to carbon dioxide so it's a very um, delicate process that you partially oxidize it to methanol but not oxidize it all the way to co2 yeah um so now i wanted i wanted to talk a bit more about your methods um so to study this enzyme you and your team used uh an x-ray free electron laser Can you tell us a bit about this apparatus and its advantages over traditional x-ray methods yes yeah, so we used an x-ray free electron laser and actually it's located right next <laughs> to um your town so it's in um, Stanford. Um, so they're at the National Laboratory, um, the Stanford um, Accelerator Laboratory, um, SLAC. They built the first um, X-ray laser worldwide and it started operation about a little bit more than 10 years ago, I think in 2008 or 2009. And this is a really unique machine. So it's using, um, it's producing very short pulses of x-rays. So normally if you use a x-ray um, generator um, in a lab or even yeah in a dentist office or wherever, these produce continuous x-rays. So you um, hit, um, hit your sample with x-rays all the time. But um, the problem is that x-rays are damaging your sample. So usually if you go do a x-ray um, for medical reasons, you need to protect um, your body, all parts that are not um, studied by, with lead, for example, and you should limit the time you're exposed to x-rays because x-rays are really um, can kick out electrons from atoms and they can really damage um, biological material. And the problem is with x-ray studies that are done normally, um, for proteins or for enzymes, you use um, X-rays at a synchrotron. So this is a circular um, structure. So it's a big um, circular ring where electrons are um, accelerated in a and then kept going around very fast at close to light speed, and then they emit X-ray radiation uh, in these facilities. And this X-ray radiation can be then used to to um, do either X-ray imaging or X-ray diffraction experiments. But the problem is that you um, push a lot of um, very damaging X-ray radiation onto your sample to get your signal out. And the idea of what, with these X-ray lasers is that you can put a lot of X-ray um, radiation onto your sample, but in a very short time. So you can... Um, do that instead of measuring your sample for many seconds or minutes, you measure it for a few femtoseconds. And in a femtosecond time scale, um, atoms cannot really move. So if you damage your sample um, by the X-rays, the atoms don't move yet. So you observe it very um, in this very short time frame, and 
you don't see any effect of the damage you cause because the damage happens on a slower time scale. So it's like you um, do a um, fast snapshot with a very fast camera and maybe people notice um, or saw this picture of like a bullet that hits an apple. <laughs> um, so you see that basically the bullet hitting the apple, but you don't see the full apple falling apart because your snapshot is very short. So you only see the, the first part, but not the later things that happen that basically show how the thing falls apart. And we use the same principle. So we look at the very early, um, very short time frame, and that way we can see things before they fall apart because of the X-ray goes. And this allows us to measure um, samples at room temperature, um, which is important to understand how they function. Also, of course, um, our bodies and like the bacteria that produce these enzymes, they all live at ambient temperature and not in a frozen state. And so this is very, it's a big advantage to use this um, new machine um, to measure things at room temperature in these very short time scales. So essentially, it's almost as if uh, you're attaching like a camera to the tip of the bullet and it takes a picture before the bullet hits the apple. Or while it's hitting, but before the apple falls apart. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. So before the apple has time to, to react to the bullet, basically. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. Um, are there any other uh, labs that have this apparatus other than Stanford? Um, yeah, they, they built a few other ones. So now there are um, five of them worldwide. So there's another one in Japan, um, and then they build one in Korea, one in Switzerland, and one in Germany. Um, so these are all operational, and they are building one currently in China, in Shanghai. So this is the sixth one, which will be um, operational in two or three years from now. Um, so there are a few around in the world, but not very many yet. So it's... Um, quite limited access to these. And these are really expensive machines. So the one in Stanford um, has a, I don't know the exact cost, but around 1 billion um, budget to build it. So it was a really expensive machine. <laughs> yeah. So um, finally, I wanted to, um, uh, to hear your thoughts on the implications of this research and maybe its prospects for the, for the future. Yeah, so what we want to do, as I mentioned, we want to look at the, um, the reaction as it proceeds. So we, we looked at the start point and the end point with this publication we, we had, but now we are preparing experiments to look at the different steps during the reaction. So we can um, give oxygen to our enzyme and then look at it at a very short time after we add oxygen, which basically starts the reaction. And this way we hope to see um, basically the answer to your question earlier, how actually this um, reaction proceeds. So we can see how the oxygen is inserted in this carbon-hydrogen bond. And one um, thing we, we hope to get out of it is to understand how this enzyme can do this reaction so efficient and with so little additional energy put in compared to industrial processes. And the hope is that by understanding this in more detail, we can maybe help to um, improve um, industrial processes that generate methanol. This would be one um, way to try to reduce the energy that is required to transform methanol, uh, methane to methanol. Um, so I think this is one big driving force for studying these enzymes that you can try to, to learn lessons from them, which you can apply to synthetic catalysts for industrial processes. So I think this is, yeah, one of our hopes for the longer future of this. And also by understanding um, more details about this um, methane-eating bacteria, basically, um, it would also maybe help to better understand how to use these bacteria 
to do um, like a biological remediation of methane generation. So one could think about um, can one build specific um, bioreactors where you use these kinds of bacteria um, to um, just put them basically next to a um, for example, a gas, uh, an oil well where you produce methane and normally it's just burned because you can't really um, efficiently um, use this methane. And so maybe one could come up with a better process to to capture this methane and, and transfer it into methanol, which could then be used um, for many other processes. So this would be another um maybe yeah thing in the future in a few years that one could try to optimize these biological processes to use them to transfer transform methane into methanol um in a way that it's um, cost efficient and attractive for a larger scale application uh so is is methanol a fuel that's burned um you can use methanol as a um, as a liquid fuel, basically, yeah. So um, it can be used instead of gasoline if you change um, change your engine um, adjust or adjust your engine. Um, so methanol is definitely easier to to store and use in engines compared to methane. So it's it has some benefits there and um, aside from using it as a fuel it's a um, starting product for many other um, subsequent steps in, in chemical synthesis as well so when it's burned it uh, produces carbon dioxide and water vapor right mm -hmm. is is there any um, enzyme or or like basically something other than trees that consumes carbon dioxide and makes something that's useful for us. <laughs> no, I think that's the main um, cycling back. So using photosynthesis and uh, um, Rubisco then to capture CO2 back into biomass. Yeah, <laughs> there's no other um, efficient process um, that that do it normally. So. Um, yeah, that's the. I think the advantage if you can capture methane and transfer it to methanol and then burn it to CO two, it would still um, emit carbon dioxide, but you would um, avoid increasing methane emissions, which are really, um, as methane is a way more potent um, greenhouse gas compared to CO two, um, you can at least reduce the impact. Um, so if you can. Capture basically the methane and transfer to methanol, and then to CO two in the end, you would reduce the total methane emission, and you would also replace um, fossil fuel CO two emissions from uh, with basically CO two emissions that come from biomass, because the methane initially produced comes from bacteria that that convert biomass. Um, so that way, it's more advantage than just using fossil fuels, although it's not completely carbon neutral. <laughs> yeah. That concludes this episode of Socratic Studios. Huge thanks to Dr. Kern for agreeing to be on the podcast, and huge thanks to you for listening. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss another episode, and we'll see you next time.